future, talk radio will actually educate, inspire, and make you think. The future is now. Topics and music that affect your life from Universal Broadcasting Network. Tune in at ubnradio.com. This is On Air with Tony Sweet, your number one source for all things entertainment, exclusive interviews, and guests from TV, film, the Broadway stage, and your favorite musical artists of today. Talking shop is a given, but deep conversation is Tony's specialty. On Air with Tony Sweet starts now, exclusively on UBN Radio. Okay, it's another Wednesday at the ranch. Right here at Universal Broadcasting Network, I'm Tony Sweet, your host, and I'm very excited to have in the studio with me a very talented actor, producer, and I guess classically trained. I mean, I have to say, I've listened to him, and he is an amazing singer. Uh, we're going to talk about his band uh, and more, and uh, we have a new uh, movie coming out. Or no, movie. Is it TV? Movie. Movie. I was going to say, it said big screen, so I'm, th- I'm taking that must be a movie. Yeah, you know, I'm from Kansas. It takes me a little bit. Uh, but Miss Sloan's coming out uh, in November, so we're going to have him right now on the show. We have Raul Benaja, right? You did it. Yes, I did it. Woo! People know that me and names don't work. Well, you've got a crazy job for that, then, haven't you? <laughs> right. <laughs> you get a new person every day. Every day. And uh, the this is exciting because you flew all the way in from Canada just to see me. And I hope you say yeah. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, well, you know, no, I'm seeing one much. or two other people, but no one as important as you. You cheater. I mean, that's all you are. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, <laughs> we want to thank you so much for being here. This is going to be a Tony. great time uh, getting to know you. And the audience, uh, I know, are, are excited about getting to know you, too. Uh, actor, producer, and musician. So, before we start talking about the current projects, I always take a time shift back to the f- or like past and find out a little bit more about who you are. Mm. And uh, I want to start like where are you from, and uh, what was your childhood like? A lot of entertainment, watching TV, listening to music. What was it all? Uh, I was born in Manchester, England. Uh, my uh, mom and dad met in Canada. Uh, before that point, obviously. Oh, uh, right. My dad's originally from India, and my mother's from Dublin, Ireland. Oh, wow. Got so, a good mix uh, in pretty there. Pretty unique mix. Yeah. And um, I, most of my life, I grew up uh, in uh, the nation's capital, my nation's capital, Canada, uh, in Ottawa. And uh, for a few years, I lived in Europe as well, because my dad worked for the Canadian government. So I, had to, I lived in what was, just give you an idea how old I am, I Uh-oh. lived in West Germany. Remember when wow. it was two separate Tear down countries? That wall. Exactly. <laughs> so I was. Uh, I grew up in uh, in Bonn, Germany, for a few years, and then um, I went to a place called the National Theater School of Canada for my training after high school, uh, which is like uh, Canada's sort of Juilliard right. type place. Mm-hmm. And then, I, then twenty years ago, I moved to Toronto as an actor. But wow. when I was growing up, uh, you know, my folks were um, into music. And theater, but I, d- I didn't really have, and movies, but I didn't really have any uh, professional artists in my family. Right. So I was definitely not from a showbiz family at all. Uh, but, uh, you know, I just kind of gravitated towards entertaining people. I was the younger of two brothers. and oh, the uh, baby. Me too. I l- yeah, so I loved entertaining people. We used to put on these little sort of Christmas concerts for our family. And <laughs> you and your brother? Yeah, and I was always uh, doing funny voices. And, and I guess I didn't think of it at the time, but, you know, growing up in a house with those different dialects and, you know, different cultures all mixed together, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I always like making, mimicking people and doing accents and voices and all that. So... You know, once I had that opportunity to be in front of people, I, geez, I can think probably by the time I was seven or eight, I just thought, wow, this is incredible. I need to do this more, and I haven't really stopped. What about your family? Uh, you're like, I want to do this. Were they supportive, or did they kind of try to steer you in a different direction? I think, you know, my parents, like a lot of parents, were wanted me to be happy and wanted me to do <laughs> right. what I wanted. But at the same time, I think they were really worried. It being such a tough profession, mm-hmm. I think when I said I wanted to be an actor, they were just like, "Oh God!" Oh, so they, go. I think they, they really wanted me to go to university and get a degree. Now, the National Theater School of Canada is a diploma program, so you don't get a degree at the end. Right. 
But, um, you know, the year I got in, they took uh, 14 of us out of about 700 applicants. Wow. So wow. when I told my parents that, and I think also with both my parents being immigrants, I, I think when they were able to tell their friends and family, oh, he got into the National Theater School of Canada. And there was uh, only 17 of them. Yeah, that, that I think in. that helped. And then yeah. I think they also thought, oh, well, maybe he is kind of good at this if he got in. I mean, <laughs> this business is a lot more arbitrary right. than that. but. But I think that at that point they calmed down. But they knew I was addicted. I mean, I went to an arts high school in my hometown. No, you did. So in your like, hometown? Yeah, really. Yeah, uh, Ottawa has uh, had one of the first uh, arts-focused high schools in Canada. There's only there were only a handful at the time when I started, and and it started in the early '80s before I went there. Mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, you know, it, was, it wasn't entirely like fame or the LaGuardia School say, of the Arts. Yeah. The fun thing about my school was it was also shared with the, it was a neighborhood school uh -huh. and an art school. <laughs> so that kind of kept everybody in check. There was a lot of fights between the jocks I'm and the sure. artsies back in my day. But, <laughs> I'm sure. but it was good because it kept people sort of like grounded. It wasn't just like everybody was in a total artsy fantasy land right, all the time. Right. So, um, but going to a high school where, you know, like I'm, I'm going to a gig tonight. My friend is playing at the Ace Hotel tonight. Dominic Salol. He's a, you know, we were in high school together, and he was in the music program and a drummer, and now he's like this big producer and songwriter here in L.A. So, you know, I was in this incredible environment where, as teenagers, you were surrounded by all these creative people, and f you know, some of us went on professionally into the arts, but for a lot of kids, it helped you actually get through high school, which is such right. a difficult time. See, that's I grew up in you know Kansas and real small town. You know, I graduated late eighties, but I couldn't imagine. I mean, I would have loved to have went to an arts high yeah. school because no, but we didn't have yeah, anything sure. like that. Most I places mean, don't. Yeah, we had like four towns that came together to make a high school. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there was thirty two people in my graduating class. Wow. Yeah, so uh, I couldn't imagine, but I would have loved to have imagined going to a high school like that. That would have been a great, I think, a great opportunity because people, I mean, when you're that age, it's you're struggling of trying to find out who you are. And being in arts, it has a tendency to let you kind of discover who you are a little bit faster, I think. And I could say in almost all those programs, you know, if your marks aren't good enough, you're out. Really? So there's a real incentive for kids to do well in school because right. if your marks got too low you couldn't stay in the program mm. so you know there's kind of a, a carrot at the end of the stick right, right so you know i know some kids definitely in my program who've gone on to have great careers now like they were some of those guys were and gals were people you thought wow they may ne never finish high school oh, because, and yeah, now, yeah. you know but that was the having that carrot at the at the end of the stick really helped them get through high school and then you know they're able to pursue mm. arts as a as a career so. well now i know we're similar in ages that, <laughs> yes. that uh you know that's been it's been 20 some years ago so yeah. uh after you left high school where, where did you go from there so the national theater school uh is a program where you can enter it after high school mm -hmm. some people go after they've got a university degree or an arts training degree right i went uh i got in right after high school so i i had to plan to go to university if i hadn't got in i actually i think one of the reasons i got into national theater school is uh, the flip side, the downside of being in this artsy high school was, you know, I was pretty, I figured I was a genius. <laughs> so I took the train down with my girlfriend and went to my Juilliard audition yeah. in New York thinking like, oh, yeah, you know. I'm gonna, hey, it's gonna be these easy. guys have any idea who I am? <laughs> and they had no idea who I was, and that was evident by the fact that I didn't get a call back. And, uh, <laughs> and they didn't know who you were after you. No, right? they didn't care at all who <laughs> yeah. I was. So... For me, that was a good lesson in, like, I wasn't prepared enough. I didn't take it seriously enough. So when that audition came a few months later for the National Theater School, I had completely sort of changed how to prepare, and mm -hmm. I had done a lot more work on it. So, you know, when I had... The, the thing, too, is if, you know, if you get into a program like that, it doesn't necessarily mean that the next if you sk if you say oh I decline it doesn't mean you're you get an automatic placement next year right. because they're trying to put a class together of the right balance right. of yeah. men and women and all that so uh, I just decided I had to go and and once I like I said was able to convince my folks it was a good idea that helped and uh, <laughs> yeah and I was there that's that's uh, the National Theater School is based in Montreal which is an incredible city in Canada that has. You know, it's in Quebec, which is a predominantly French-speaking mm -hmm. uh, pro province. Do you speak so, French? Yeah, functionally, but not very well. Uh, I should speak better French, uh, as it's the second official, <laughs> it's the other official language right. in Canada. But 
uh, it was really cool to be in that culture and and to and you know that's a great city for arts and and per, you know performance and and there's a um, also Toronto's Toronto's a bit it's for Toronto for a long time has been called Hollywood North oh really so it's a bit more of a showbiz town yeah. and a bit more business oriented so. It was nice to be in a place where, you know, everybody wasn't talking about, oh, mm-hmm. I've got an audition and I'm leaving school early to go. You know, we focused very much on our art and focused <laughs> on our theater studies. And and so then when it came time to enter the profession, you know, you'd really spent three full years of just um, chipping away at <laughs> the craft of acting. Now, uh, you said Toronto was kind of the nor- Hollywood North, but has that changed to now Vancouver? Because I hear everybody I talk to that they film, it's always in Vancouver. Well, you know, Vancouver has had incredible growth, particularly of uh, projects from America. Mm -hmm. And that really started with, I mean, you can cite X-Files as one of the shows that really changed that. When a show like X-Files of that quality and that uh, sort of quantity was made in in Vancouver, um, it really changed the conversation. So Vancouver's had an enormous amount of American production there. Hmm. Toronto's been split a bit more between American production and domestic production. So Canadian films, Canadian original Canadian television, and that's uh, some more of what my background has been, and I haven't been in quite as much uh, American stuff because that's been more focused in Vancouver. Also, you know, Vancouver's a much shorter plane ride to here right. uh, to LA and it's in the same time zone and that's the, there's practical True. elements to that which uh, yeah when you're calling somebody at 2 but o'clock the, the, in the morning the best <laughs> one is when you see uh, oh gosh what was that Jackie Chan movie about New York uh, the, the the one the, you know there's some pretty funny shots though where you'll see things set in New York and it'll just quickly pan by and you'll see like the Rocky Mountains in the background and you'll go now wait a second <laughs> last time I was in Manhattan I couldn't I see an remember. enormous mountain range <laughs> right. so uh, you know that, that, that creeps in now and again but, uh, but no they're both very busy places right now, and also you know uh, the Canadian dollar is weaker right now, right. so that's been another incentive for right. people to come up because you can get a lot more, a lot more value. Yeah. yeah. So when you went to college, uh, did you really know the direction that you wanted to go in? I mean, I know you, you were in the arts, but did you really know like television, film, theater, musical, whatever? Did you have a kind of a direction you wanted to go, or not yet? Well, when I was in that art school, I was in the drama program, mm-hmm. so I was always focused on the theater side of things, and I pretty much knew I wanted to be an actor. And then at the National Theater School, you specialize very specifically in different things, like you know, stage management or mm-hmm. design. So I pretty much at 19 decided, oh yeah, I want to be an actor. So I, I, I went into the program as like acting, right. which is the hilarious thing, because you, you leave that school with a diploma in acting, which is <laughs> incredibly applicable to one thing, right, and, right. and absolutely unapplicable to everything else. <laughs> yeah, if it doesn't work out, you better figure out where you're going back <laughs> right. to school for right. dentistry or whatever you want to do. <laughs> so uh, it is a bit of a high-risk game, but no, I, I knew that uh, acting was a big part of it, and then you know, because I had this interest in, in, in music and, and I had a band in high school, I always had this draw to, to play music as well. And at various times in my life, uh, even probably until about a decade ago, I tried to sometimes choose like, okay, just forget this, you're going to be a musician full time. Oh, no, no, forget this, you're going to be an actor full time. So, and then I realized, you know, I was only happy if I really had both things in my life. There was really no point in sequestering part of what I wanted to do. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's a challenge with scheduling. Sometimes mm-hmm. there's conflicts. But, you know, there are two things I love doing, and they, they kind of feed each other. And sometimes people go like, you know, how can you play blues and do Shakespeare? <laughs> and, and to but me... you're like, why not? Well, to me, it's... it's to me, they're all very closely aligned, as is acting on television or mm-hmm. film and theater. Like, mm-hmm. it's all... I, I don't. To me, they don't feel that different. Mm-hmm. You know, they're they're just different mediums where you're telling a story. Mm-hmm. And and I think of myself not so much as an actor who's um, self-expressing, but more of an actor or performer who's telling a story. Mm. And blues is absolutely a right. music that. Well. Yeah, I woke up this morning, and my baby was gone. Right. You know, blues really is a music. It's, a, that's it's about, an emotional ride too. Yeah. Like anything, like all the arts, but you know, blues especially is an emotional ride. And that's a music that's really about making a connection to the audience. Yeah. So when I was a kid around the same time, getting to go see these blues legends live in my hometown, because back then people did a lot of van tours. So you know, I'd go see. 
James Cotton or I'd go see Albert Collins. I'd see these legendary blues guys and Matt Guitar Murphy, who's from, you know, uh, the Blues Brothers movie. When I would get <laughs> to go see these guys, you know, I'd be watching them in clubs like I play in now, you know, with 50, 100 people there. And I get to go up and talk to these legends and interact with them. Right. And that made me love the music even more because, you know, rock music at that time was, you know, some of the bands didn't even look at the audience, you know, let alone oh, talk yeah, to them, yeah. you know, like, uh, like if you were a hot chick, you had time. a chance, yeah, but right. everybody else, <laughs> right. you know, if you're some nerdy guy who liked their band, it's like, screw Throw off. a piece of garment up there, you got their <laughs> attention. <laughs> yeah. They were not interested in me in any way, shape, or form. Right. And, and uh, so I found blues was such a, the artists who made it were so accessible. And, and there's a tradition in blues, too, of you know, passing on the tradition and people getting you up to jam and people encouraging you mm -hmm. to keep the music alive because it is a niche music and it is a folk oh, yeah. music. Total. So, so, uh, so you know, for me, it's all just one kind of big old performance soup that I'm that I'm in, uh, and I produced a lot of my own work uh, in all those fields because uh, I like to tell stories. Well, well I, as an actor and musician, I hope you do. <laughs> if you don't like to <laughs> yeah. tell stories, the audience member is going to be like, "What the? What's this guy talking about?" But you know, you'd be surprised because sometimes I think actors are are some actors have the, um, you know, so, again some and there's nothing wrong with it, but some actors are really in it as a form of self expression, which is true, which is true, and that and can I've work. Met those. And and that's uh, and I have friends who who really see it that way. And that's fine, but for me, I, I, I feel I'm much more of value if I'm uh, like a team player in an ensemble trying to tell a bigger story. Right, and I, I've actually had friends that were actors and well-known actors that they just said, I'm just good at it, and it's easy money, and I don't have to work all the time. And yeah. I mean, I'm like... <laughs> I mean, do you tell this actually to people? And they're like, no, of course not. But, yeah, you know, yeah, it's yeah. like they just said, I'm good at it. And I'm just like, okay. And I would, <laughs> I mean, I would I'm say, like, I, and I, to that person, I would say, obviously you're very good and you're damn lucky. You're <laughs> it, damn yeah, lucky. It's true. If you it's can true. be in that position. Well, but you she, know. Does. she works all the time. Yeah. I mean, all the time. It's great. Uh, so, you know, you, you went to high school, college, you've, have, you've had a band, you've worked in the arts. When was that first job that you got that you just felt wow this this is starting to get legit i mean you know doing it as a practice and in a high school even in a college you don't feel quite that professional level yet sure. but when you get that first job what was that first job for you well my first job in the theater really professionally when i left school was uh, there's a theater festival in rural uh, ontario the province i live in called the blythe festival and they're a summer theater, but they specialize in only original Canadian works. Hmm. Because, you know, 40 years ago in Canada, there was really, you know, we didn't have the tradition of a Tennessee Williams right, or right. Arthur Miller. We didn't have original Canadian playwrights. So about 40 years ago, there was a move to start creating, you know, plays by Canadians, for Canadians. And this incredible summer theater uh, did that. So uh, this legendary director uh, hired me to improvise and uh, help co-create a play about a uh, traveling country music uh, radio show that was modeled kind of <laughs> after the Opry yeah, yeah. that was in that rural part of Ontario called the CKNX Barn Dance. CKN. CKNX Barn Dance. <laughs> Coming to you live from Owen Sound tonight. And so... Uh, and I had this incredible experience of going to a part of my province I'd never lived in before, mm. and I got to interview these real sort of now, the guys were in their 60s and 70s at that point, these legendary country musicians from that area, and I learned all about country music and stuff I, I hadn't really you known much grow about. grow up listening yeah. to it, I'm sure, right? And so I had an incredible time with that job. And also, there's a real interesting experience as an actor where your first professional job is you're playing a real person who you interview, who's also not only known among his community, mm -hmm. but on opening night, he's in the audience. Oh, wow. So that was a really interesting yeah. experience as an actor because all of a sudden that idea of like, oh, I shall play the great roles. <laughs> there was no, you know, it I'm wasn't right. very fictional. Right. It was very real. <laughs> you're like, oh my God. You know, and you're talking, about, you know, and you're doing a scene about him hitting on the hitting on a girl in the back of a car in 1952 and you know he's sitting there with his <laughs> wife and his grandkids and you go holy smokes so that was a big show for me and then on camera 
really the first big one was um, I was hired to play John the Baptist <laughs> in this uh, small Canadian film called Extraordinary Visitor in 1997. So I'd been out of school a year. And I, it's kind of a double-edged sword because I got this incredible job playing John the Baptist in this really weird comedy set in Newfoundland, which is this very unique beautiful part of Canada, which its own very strong cultural, cultural identity. I play John the Baptist in this weird movie where he, 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 the world is going to end, so he comes back after seven, he comes back in the seven days to decide if the world should end or not. <laughs> and he runs into these local folks and he makes up his mind. And, but, you know, I was, num- I was like number one on the call sheet and I had like 30 wow. days of work and it was the first film I ever did. So you're like, this you know, is easy. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> uh, like your friend you were talking about. I was like, hey, I'm good at it. I like it. I want to do this all the time. So I was pretty much hooked on the idea of being on film or on television after that experience because, you know, you're driving the story, you're all over it. You know, you came to learn over time that uh, <laughs> a very uh, select group of actors get to be number one on every movie they do right. in their lives or right. every TV show. And, uh, and sometimes for a short period of time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that, w- But that was, uh, you know, and it, it premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival, wow. and I had, like, an industry pass. I, like, so I was like, oh, this is easy. Like, yeah, yeah, I could go <laughs> see any movie I want. And, I mean, 20, that's, you know, 18 years ago it premiered. So uh, Toronto's turned into an enormous film festival now. It was much... It had sort of uh, it was a bit sweeter back then, right, right. a bit cuter, I should say. So, um, so yeah, that was really the I think the first job on camera where where I went, wow, at this level, mm-hmm. you know. And compared to the the film I'm talking to you about today, it's it's a, it, you know it's a small little film, but you know to be the big fish in the small right. little film was kind of an amazing experience. And I think you know that's always going to be ingrained into your heart and soul because that is your first big experience but i'm seeing you you know you've done over 75 different films looking back over those films is there one character that you really stood out to you that you really loved the most where you walked away and said that that actually made an impact on me well, it's about you know it's, I'm up to about eighty credits now, and that's wow. be- that's between film and television too. Though. Right. So uh, I've probably been in about fifteen movies over the years. Uh, that's still a lot. That's yeah. Still quite a few. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of indies and small things, but a couple <laughs> bigger ones. You know, it's interesting. I um, I did a really weird TV series in Canada about ten years ago, which was called Train Forty Eight, and it was a daily soap. But think of it more like a soap opera like Coronation Street or EastEnders from the Uh UK, less like Guiding Light or General (laughs) Hospital. (laughs) Because it was about regular people, and it was modeled on an Australian show, and it was about people who take a commuter train from the city to the suburbs every night. Was Was it all based on the train? We never left the train. (laughs) Really? That's funny. We made 318 half-hour episodes. Oh, my God, that's a lot. And all the dialogue was improvised. All improvised. All, yeah. Now we had a, we had an outline like of each a subject scene. Type of thing. Yeah, or? we had an outline of each scene, and we had a plot, and we had tons of writers working on it because oh we God. had these you know soap like <laughs> right. plots. Um, there were no evil twins. We never jumped the shark <laughs> on an evil yeah. twin. But but basically it was, uh, and that was an incredible experience because first of all, I was on. Uh, here's the other thing: we would arrive at 7 a.m. in the morning, and it was on TV that night at 7 p.m. Uh, it was crap. shot almost like a live sporting event. Two cameras and a switcher that just went camera. Not a, much camera editing beat. on that. No, uh, they had about an after we finished shooting, they had about an hour and a half to kind of clean up the cut, and then it was on TV that night. So that was an incredible job because one, uh, it was steady for a couple years. Right. Uh, I didn't make an enormous. I mean, it wasn't like I did 318 episodes of Friends. Right. <laughs> uh, otherwise, you know, I'd be I would have been carried in here on a plate. Uh, or a chariot of some kind. So, but he uh, did want me to, f- with the yeah, fan the, fa- with the feather. This, the, the olive <laughs> fan, the olive uh, fan is quite nice right now. But no, I, uh, you know, so so that was an incredible job for me because I I had the steady gig. Um, it was very creative, mm-hmm. and as a you know a storyteller type actor, mm-hmm. I had so much input because I got to make up what the character said. Usually, That's as an actor, you're trying to crazy. figure out how do I make this person's line yeah. work. Instead, you were just looking at the plot going, okay, how do I make this plot work? 
Uh, and actually, I think this series has just been put on uh, in the U.S. on Amazon Prime. Now, really? It, I don't know if it'll make any sense to anybody here, but I think you can watch all 318 episodes. Prime. So have, to, have a look. Train have to, 48, it's called. All right, and you can I'm see it's it low up. budget. It looks crazy and terrible and weird, <laughs> but it's sort of like an, it's an addictive kind of show. And if well, someone wants it. to binge watch, it'll only take them, you know, 48 was, days. <laughs> but I was going to say it must have been good enough to to like stay on for 300 and some yeah. where people actually watched it. And you know, it's fu- a funny thing, you know, where I'm from, uh Canadian television, domestic television is of course always dwarfed by the huge shows right. from here right. because, you know, they're promoted totally differently, they right. have huge budgets and listen, everyone wants to see what the new big show is. But you know, for a Canadian show, it, for a modest little thing that was on one of the networks, you know, it was the first show I was in where y- as a Canadian, I would be recognized. I was going to ask you that, if, if and that was you, you know, uh, Canadian actors are we're basically anonymous. Like we're used to being <laughs> just you're only really recognized if, if you're in an American project, right? Right. Um, so that was fun for us because <laughs> you know I'd I'd been in town acting for seven or eight years uh, doing TV and you know movies and stuff, and then you used but, to wear T-shirts. I am, <laughs> I am the guy. Um, so it was a uh, you know that was a cool experience because I. Uh, I, I'd never really had that, uh, you know. Again, nothing like if you're on CSI or something like that regularly. Right. But it was it was it was fun. And uh, e- these ten years later, a lot of us have looked back on that job, going, "Wow, yeah, we never really had a creative experience mm-hmm. quite like that." Well, I think I always tell people when I think of like improv or uh, off the cuff, even though I can do it as Tony Sweet, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but on stage and go go. I, I feel my upper upper <laughs> lip start sweating just to think about having to create that dialogue that's con- going to be consistent and a flow to it with another actor. I couldn't imagine doing that. I've always tried to keep it as a component. Here's one that'll freak you out. I was just workshopping a brand new project at the Stratford Shakespeare Festival yeah. in Canada, mm-hmm. which is uh, called an Undiscovered Shakespeare, where this brilliant woman Rebecca Northern has come up with this format where. We interview, I played Shakespeare, and I interviewed a person from the audience for the first half, and I Mm -hmm. asked them about a true life love story they have. And then the second part, we improvise it in iambic pentameter as an undiscovered play of Shakespeare. (laughs) So if you want to, if you want to watch me sweat, you know, come watch that. So I, but I've always tried to keep improv as a part of it because it's incredibly exhilarating as an actor to do, but it's great training. Like I, by doing this crazy Shakespeare thing in the summer, I learned a lot about how Shakespeare's mm. plays work, even right. though I've worked on Shakespeare's plays for 20 years as well. <laughs> Looking at it through that lens kind of did that too. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm kind of someone, often people have said, you know, are you a musician? Are you an actor? Are you an improviser? Or do you do theater? Do you do television? Are you a movie actor? And so, you know, I kind of love the variety. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and I think part of how you survive in this business is to be able to do a lot of different stuff. The more stuff you can do... Um, and Canadians often have a, uh, the reputation in Hollywood. Not nec- you know, we definitely have some Canadians who are stars, and frankly, a lot of you Americans don't know. Ryan Reynolds is Canadian. Rachel <laughs> McAdams is Canadian. We all know. But uh, one of my favorite singers, Celine Dion. Celine Sorry. Dion. Wow. Um, <laughs> see, the all Canadian women can sing, and Canadian men can't, but they're still stars. <laughs> Leonard Cohen, God, da, 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 Neil Young. Ee, you know, I didn't know Neil Young. Neil Young's time. Canadian too. So, but they lived in California forever. Um, but uh, you know, we we have a reputation often when we do come to Hollywood and meet people. They often know that wow, if you've been a, if you've been working in Canada for twenty years, uh, you know what you're doing because you've had to do everything. Right. To, right. You know. Right. It's not like oh well, I did that one big series and now I'm living off it. That doesn't happen. Where not I'm gonna from. happen. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a lot of people I know. <laughs> and I think every, it is funny how people, no matter where you live, if you think of Hollywood actors, if you have one television show, even if it's like two years, they think oh they must live in a mansion. I'm like, well, I used to think that until I moved out here and yeah. see now most of my friends that are have been on TV two or three yeah live in apartments. Barely sure. can pay the rent. Yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah, yeah. it's getting, and it's it getting more and it's getting more like that now. I mean, oh, that's a whole other conversation. But yeah, it's definitely, uh, you know, uh, you know, people think you, you know, you do one episode of a TV show and you can buy a house, and right. it's like, 
you know, no. he, it's not yeah, like, I had like a series for like three or four years. Well, now <laughs> when uh, when uh, every house in Los Angeles costs over a million dollars, you, you got to be on a series for five years and that's to have the that low kind end. of money. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, one thing you said that when people ask you, you know, you're a musician, are you an actor, or this? I think 20 years ago, 25, 30 years ago, that was a big question. But I think nowadays, so many people cross over. It's it's mm. like the TV stars right. and the film stars of, of yesteryears. It used to be like, oh, I would never do TV. And the film stars were, or you know, TV stars would be like, oh, I don't want to do it. But now they're crossing over so much, I think, because, you know, it's a job. Yeah. Um, but the mu- the music side of it. Uh, we've been talking about your TV film, but the music side of it, you have you have a band, and the band yeah. is... Raul and the Big Time. Very easy to know whose right. band it is. I thought, well, I got this crazy first name. Right. People come <laughs> in, and when I play in a blues club, people are like, oh, is that your stage name? I'm like, no, it's not my stage <laughs> it's name. It's my, my name. real name. I because people would always go, oh, what's the name of your band? And I thought, well, if I put my name in it, then people will know, oh, that must be Raul's band. So, yeah, Dude, uh, like, 18 years ago, I called it Raul and the Big Time. Yeah, And it's generally worked. Did they ask? I'm going to show a picture of you guys. Uh, so introduce uh, if you uh, for the people that are watching. If you're listening to the podcast, you know you can always go to YouTube and watch the video. But uh, of course, the one on the left is yourself. That's me, followed by uh, Darren Gallen, our brilliant guitar player, longtime uh, veteran of the Canadian music scene, who just celebrated his 69th birthday. Terry Wilkins oh, on the upright bass. Yeah, he's been in all these legendary Canadian bands. The Rough Trade is probably one of his most famous ones, and then multiple Maple Blues Award winner for drummer of the year, Tom Bona. Is on the oh, end. Oh, wow. And I also have an eight piece version of the band that I tour around with as well sometimes, which has horns and piano as well. The the guy on the right, you said who is that? The drummer? Uh, Tom Bona is his Tom, name. Tom, well, with that tie, it makes him look like a minister. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a white. Like I said, my, 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 the, the, my <laughs> friend who books my band basically said, You guys need new photos. You look like angry guys at a convention. <laughs> I was like, Well, we're businessmen. You know, we're businessmen. But yeah. And how long have you been together? Uh, 18 years. 18? Wow. Yeah, you were just a baby. Well, yeah, that's it. And the thing with blues is, you know, when you get to about year 15, people go, yeah, they're all right. You know, because the amazing thing about blues is you kind of never get too old for it. Right, uh, it's right. An, and, and in some ways, you don't really get respect until you've been doing it for a long it's time. It's gospel Christian sometimes. Like yeah. same way. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, yeah. and so that's the fun part is, is that you think, oh, yeah, this is music I can just keep doing. The downside is it's very hard in blues to be an overnight success because, you know, you got to pay your dues. And, right. and I think that's fair because... The musicians that are in front of us, you know, the great guys who were left from the from the beginning of the modern mm-hmm. era of blues, you know, Buddy Guy. Think of Buddy Guy. Well, you know, he's 80 years old almost, and he's been playing forever. And, you know, he drove a truck and played all night and had a day job and played and played mm-hmm. and played. So, you know, those guys deserve uh, the place they have. Or, of course, the late, great B.B. King, who was the king of the blues. You know, these guys... Uh, deserve that place and that honor. So I don't mind being in the b- mm-hmm. back of the line of those guys. Well, I grew up, you know, I grew up in Kansas, but I lived in Kansas City for seven years. And oh, so wow. they had a lot of, you know, jazz and blues. Jazz and blues, co- incredible. Clubs there. Jazz and yeah. blues there, yeah. Uh, but, you know, when you said 18, so you must have been pretty young. And, and a lot, it, it's kind of like a... Um, Kind of like a, these fifteen-year-old pop singers singing about relationships. <laughs> how so, does a how does a twenty-one-year-old sing right, about how the blues? Do, how does twenty-one-year-old <laughs> sing about the blues? How does that work? How 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 did they accept you at well, that age? I guess you know that's part of it. Is that you know uh, people in the music like young people to be playing it because that ensures that it has a future, right? But I think uh, I just saw this great movie on the plane that a friend of mine directed with Ethan Hawke called Born to Be Blue, which is about Chet Baker. And there's a scene in it where Chet Baker and Miles Davis meet at the Birdland Club, and it's this sort of seminal night for Chet Baker that sort of changed his life. And basically, you know, Miles Davis looks him in the eyes and basically says, you know, like, "Hey, white boy, you gotta live. A li- <laughs> you gotta live a little." You know, because Chet right. was this, you know, really handsome guy from California right. who was sort of a matinee idol of jazz. And so it's true, you know, the music gets better the more you live mm-hmm. and the more you, true. you feel it. Um, but at the same time, I think, you know, when young people play it, there's an energy to it, mm-hmm. and there's kind of a... And also, you're maybe able to bring in an audience that's closer. I mean, the hilarious thing now is, you know, I'm trying to bring a 40-year-old audience to blues, because a lot of the audience that's used to seeing blues is now in their 60s and right. 70s. They were the people who, every Friday and Saturday night, went out to a club to see live music. Mm-hmm. We don't... The generation coming up doesn't have that pattern, 
So, and people interact with it on their phones and interact with it on YouTube. So it's a different relationship to live music. We used to have lots of gigs because every club had a dance floor and needed live music mm. to sell booze because that's how people met. Right. Well, right. if you can just swipe right or swipe left and go meet at a coffee <laughs> right. shop, you know, it's, it's funny. But even that has changed how... Yeah. Uh, how much live music is required? Oh yeah, I, I I'm a I'm actually a singer too. I oh, that's cool. how I started in getting in radio. I was on a reality show in Nashville. Mm. It was on the, the Gospel Dream. It was a gospel. Holy Christian smokes! Music. So yeah. yeah, you know the deal. Yeah, yeah. I but I that's why I said I love music. I love all music. Even even not a big rap person. I like it if it's mixed with music. Sure. But um, but pretty much everything else I enjoy hmm. because I love the expression. Uh, if especially I can tell if somebody uh, like the actors, if they're just great singers and they're just singing it, or if somebody's telling the story. Right. If they're telling me the story and I'm getting emotional. It's working. They've they've done their job. Sure. Is there a song that you have created? Uh, is all your songs originals, or do you? Did uh, you know, you... Uh, when I put out a record, I try to have <clears throat> you know the majority of it be right. originals, but live, like to I like to other. put in a few of the classics. Yeah. Again, though, but the classics I like are from the 1950s. I mean, every time I'm in this town and I drive by Capitol Records, right, I just think right. Of, you know, like he wasn't so much a blues musician, but you know, someone like Nat King Cole, oh. and but the era, you know, Aladdin Records in California, yeah. there you know, T Bone Walker, you know, there were these incredible California blues musicians that I I uh, I admired and loved. So yeah, I play a few of the the old standards, but I really love that period of blues in the nineteen uh, late forties into the very early sixties. Mm-hmm. That's really kind of influenced the kind of music I play. So even though I, I write original music, it's very strongly influenced by that period. Well, we hope it's so. somebody that you enjoy or music that you enjoy that influ- influence you to write. Yeah. I mean, you can tell when somebody writes music, it's about Celine Dion or Mariah Carey or sure. Michael Jackson or Prince. All of them, you can tell who inspired them. So I mean, that's I, that's why I think musicians are there to inspire the next generation. And, and so. I think in my generation, what happened was a lot of us came up hearing what you describe more as blues rock. Right. You know, like uh, sort of Stevie Ray Vaughan and around that where it was really like loud guitars and really rocking. And then some of us, particularly if you're, I mean, I'm a harmonica player. so that, Are you, you really? Can, you can only turn that darn thing up so loud <laughs> right. and it starts to feed back. So then a lot of us went back to, okay, who were the guys who inspired them or who inspired the Rolling Stones? Oh, mm-hmm. it was this guy Muddy Waters or Little Walter or Howlin' Wolf. So we kind of went, a bunch of us kind of went back. Uh, because that that sort of blues rock field was very crowded. Mm, so I, I love it. You know, I love that mix of jazz and blues in particular, and that is the West Coast sound. And this most recent album I made out here called Hollywood Boulevard. I made half of it in California, half of it in Toronto. And it oh, wow. features a bunch of legendary Californian blues musicians. I don't know if you know this, listeners, but the great Mavis Staples, the gospel singer yeah. from Chicago. Yeah. Pretty much her whole band are these incredible musicians really? right here from Los Angeles. Uh, La Angeles, huh? Yeah, the blues boys from here. Rick Holmstrom uh, is a guitar player who in, it sort of embodies pop staples. And then on a couple other tracks, I got to play with Larry Taylor, who is from Canned Heat. You know, Damn. played at Woodstock. You know, and wow. and uh, and these guys have a great reputation and, and history of playing in the blues. So you this know, be, I, well, I, I love playing out here. I love being out here because the, there's so many great musicians. Well, we're gonna we're not done. We're almost we're gonna talk about Miss Sloan right mm-hmm. now. But uh, uh, I can't believe the times like going so fast. I'm like, oh crap. <laughs> uh, but I, I can't. We're gonna play one of your songs on the cool. way out. So great. all right. So R. M. Dutton. So Miss Sloan, tell us about. Uh, the movie and your character. So uh, it's going to be... I, I, even watching the trailer, I'm like, okay, this is going to be good. It's going to be good. <laughs> you know, when the when the auditions came out for Miss Sloan, uh, we knew Jessica Chastain was going to star in it, and we knew that John Madden, this British director, not the football coach... I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> John Madden? <laughs> John Madden, wow. <laughs> Touchdown! Um, John Madden, this great British film director who had done, you know, Exotic Marigold Hotel, mm-hmm. uh, you know, so many great movies. Um, Shakespeare in Love is one of his, is mm-hmm. his Oscar nominated film. Uh, he was coming to town and he was going to do this movie, and there were roles that were available. So, um, I was the first guy to audition for the film in Toronto on the very first day, and uh, I was nervous because when I read the script, I thought, Holy smokes, this is one of the best things I have read in ages. And subsequently, I learned as all my other friends showed up that morning, everybody was just you know, texting each other going, man, did you read the script? This is incredible. I can't believe it. Justin Chastain's going to be in it. So I was very fortunate to ultimately get cast in it. And uh, 
the the fun thing about R. M. Dutton is uh, he's described on the breakdown as being a um, in his fifties, uh, you know, uh, salt and pepper hair, piercing blue eyes, and a textbook lobbyist. I'm looking so, at your eyes. Huh? Yeah, and if you're watching this, you can see uh, I'm. None of those things. Yeah, I'm 42, right. so first of all, but uh, so it was really fun for me because when I, I I read for a different part which I didn't get, and they called me in for for Dutton, um, who's who's kind of uh, works for the a lobby firm in Washington on the kind of conservative side of the spectrum, and the firm I'm involved in is trying to get the contract from the NRA to mm-hmm. be their lobbyist in Washington, and Elizabeth Sloan, Jessica's character. Uh, works with us, and then at a point in the movie, she switches sides. And that's pretty much what the movie's about, right. is someone who has been on one team of lobbyists switching to the other team of lobbyists. And Which very, is not rare. Yeah, and a very topical film this time of year right. in this country. <laughs> right. You know, It's an incredibly, uh, you know, it's quite brave, actually, to put it out just after the election, because, you know, it's a, it's a really, um, you know, it's such a tumultuous time here. So... Um, so I was thrilled when I got the part because when I went in, I, I desperately wanted it. But of course, as an actor, you can't be too desperate because you know you can smell that in the audition mm-hmm. room. Uh, and I sort of thought, oh, I'm not going to get this. Look at the breakdown. I mean, I'm not, I don't look like this. And and John, to his credit, just said, No, you're the right person for this. Don't worry about that. Who cares about that? You're right. So. You know, I then went on to have kind of one of the most incredible experiences in my career working on this film. I mean, he's hmm. it's one of the best scripts I've ever read. He's Probably the greatest, I think one of the greatest directors I've ever worked with. Wow, wow! And Jessica Chastain, you know, um, listen, I've been in stuff over the years, and she's uh, gorgeous. She's a gorgeous woman, but she's an incredible actor, yeah. and to get to see her work up close, because you know, I'll admit, uh, not every time on the call sheet is number one a person that can be easy to work with. First of all, if someone is the number one on the film, they're under a huge amount of pressure. Mm -hmm. They have a lot to worry about. And um, some people really want to protect themselves. That's not uncommon. So, you know, sometimes you'll be working on a film and you'll have scenes with that person and you'll you'll finish the whole experience and you'll feel like you barely know them. You've barely had a conversation when the camera's not rolling with them. And you just have to accept that and go, hey, that's what they need. Yeah, my job here is to tell the story. Right. Uh, but Jessica was incredible because I think she felt very comfortable with John, uh, who'd given her a break five or six years before in a movie. And uh, she, re- I was, just, I watched her how she worked on this film, and I thought, God, I wish every young actor who gets their first break could see how she's mm. running the show here because incredible energy, fourteen-hour days, twelve-hour days, never failing, never flagging. Hmm, and wow. uh, and uh, and you know That's knew great. knew all the crew's name knew all the cast name somebody new would come in welcome them and you know everyone yeah, starstruck you don't hear that too often no everybody's <laughs> starstruck everybody's nervous you know if right. you got a one day part on that thing and you got a scene with Jessica Chastain you can imagine people are just yeah. like freaking out so so I had an incredible experience on that film and my scenes were predominantly I had a uh, scene with Jessica but my scenes are predominantly with. Sam Waterston, mm. who is, you know, just such a legend of right. sc- stage and screen, and Michael Stuhlbarg, who's a great actor as well. So I, I and then, you know, I'd be sitting I'd be sitting on my chair in between takes, and then, oh, it was the day that John Lithgow showed up. So then oh Sam Waterston and John Lithgow were talking about, uh, hey, remember that time we threw that party for Joe Papp at the public? <laughs> oh, I remember that night. And, you know, for a theater nerd like me, like, oh my, God. my jaw's on the ground. I'm like, I can't believe I'm here. And then to across the way from me is Alison Pill, also a Canadian, wonderful actor, mm. younger than me, but you know she's done theater as well, and she's just a great actress. So Alison's there, and then right beside me is Mark Strong, who won the Tony this year for A View from the Bridge, yeah. who's an incredible wow. actor. So you know I'm sitting there, and I just can't. You know, I'm like, oh, you're just, you're just I soaking want, it in. Yeah, I'm like, I want to do this every day. <laughs> I want every film right. I'm in to feel like this. I yeah. want to be with these actors. Yeah. Uh, so it was Good a it you. was a magical experience. Good for you. Well, I uh, listen. Time has pretty much ran out, but I, I have to say, I can't wait to see it. I'm a big political junkie. Type oh, you're of gonna person. love it. You're yeah. gonna love it because it's and, a great uh, film for that. Yeah, and uh, but uh, that's coming out when? December 9th is oh, the two days uh, after my birthday. There you go. Uh, they they set it up that way. I do. I think yeah. they've. Uh, I think it's you know because they're setting it up for kind of the Oscar 
race and oh, consideration. Right. I right. hope I hope she's considered for it because it's an incredible performance from her, from what I could see. And uh, you know, and it's in that sort of Christmas mm-hmm. serious movie right. thing. Uh, but the fun thing about it too is that you know Johnny, who wrote it, uh, it's the first film he ever wrote. What? And he was a to- that whole that's a whole other story. Uh, you should get I him would, on the show when you have a chance. I would love that. Johnny is this guy who uh, was uh, living outside of the U.S. He uh, wrote this script. He got on IMDb Pro and found every manager he could find and emailed them the script. And this one guy, Scott Carr, Took a this chance. manager read it and thought, "Heck, this is pretty good. I'm going to meet this guy." And a That's year and it. a half later, he's on set with that cast, Holy making crap. a studio movie. See, that, that's <laughs> a that's the testimony for the people out there that really just like eh, n- nobody's going to listen, nobody's going to read it. Nobody's no, and nine times out of ten, nobody does. Nobody but does. But that one time, it only takes one time. That's a Hollywood story. I I, I still yeah. can't believe it, and it's inspirational. And yeah. you know, it it was uh, something. He just created from his imagination. It's a it's a fictional story from his imagination. He didn't take it from a book. He took it from real well, life well, events. Wasn't compiled that his Harry Potter thing. and yeah. Twilight and all yeah. these were just imaginations? Yeah. So 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 it's a, it's a great story that way. I mean, uh, you know, we're all excited. We all hope the film does well. But the uh, I think it will. The, I mean, the chemistry around it was really interesting. Good for and, you. Yeah, I had a great time. Well, I'm excited. But tell us uh, any places I know you may not be performing here, but for your band. Uh, yeah, you know. I'm be well, on Saturday night in Toronto, I'll be at the, one of my old homes, the Rex Hotel with the seven piece version of the band at 194 Queen Street West. I'll be there from 9:30 on. Uh well, let's drive up. Hey. Yeah, hey, it's only JT ready to go. It's only five <laughs> it's only a 5 day drive. Right, Don't worry yeah. about it. Yeah. Uh we'll just and drive up. Uh, yeah, and then I'm taking this play that I produced uh, called Disgraced, uh, which won the Pulitzer a few years ago. We're taking that to the Citadel Theater in Edmonton, which I'm performing with my wife, Brigitte Solom, who's also an actor. So we're taking that to the Citadel Theater in January. So those are kind of our other big upcoming shows. Well, I really enjoyed hearing your story. And Thanks, I'm man. so glad you came in, and I uh, hope you come back and see me. Uh, Raul. Uh, Not, yes, you got it. Ben- Benaja. I believed, and so did you. Oh, oh, oh my God. That, that was applause for me. It wasn't for you, <laughs> just because I couldn't say it. But no, thanks. Thank you so much, Ron. I appreciate it. And uh, tell us all. Uh, finish your water there. But tell us where do people find you? Twitter uh, or off Facebook? Uh, yeah, uh, Twitter's Raul uh, at Raul Benaja. Uh, Facebook is Raul Benaja actor slash musician. What else could I come up with? I know, right? And um, <laughs> and it's it's undergoing some renovations. But you can also go to RaulBenaja.com. And we're going to go out with High Roller by your band. Yeah, this was sort of a song I wrote inspired by our late mayor, the. Uh, Infamous Rob Ford, who made Toronto famous for a very short time. I wonder and, why. <laughs> and that's my only cautionary tale about your yeah. election, I'd say, America. If you, if you uh, decide to turn the White House into a circus, the worst part of it is, is that nothing will get done. Nothing in Toronto got done while the late Rob Ford was our... Uh, he died. Not, yeah, he died, yeah. Recently. He got a terrible cancer and died. It was terrible. Wow. It's a very sad story. But this was sort of in his... Uh, this was in his heyday. And this song I actually recorded with... Uh, these those great uh, uh, California musicians I was telling you about. We recorded this in the great studio here in Burbank. So this oh, is awesome. this is California blues for you right here. California blues. Okay. <laughs> All right. This is on over Tony Sweet. Uh, we're going to see you next week, and we want to thank our new friend here, Rao. But uh, check out the movie coming out December 9th, uh, and uh, go and listen to some of the music, Rao in the big time. So here it is. Hi, Roller. See you next time. My hands are dirty, full stone up to shreds. My wife done left me, told the kids that I am dead. Slaughtered in the mud, fleeced of every share. Skyscraper staying open, but I ain't allowed back there. Fortune smiling upside down, I'm a high roller with a frown. So I trashed the DMV, called them all hypocritical. Now the cops is after me, fortune smiling upside down. I'm a high roller with a frown.
better. Tell everybody I live real good. They got gates around my old neighborhood. These cold streets, just one more hit to clear my head. I used to be a winner. I get the cold shoulder, my face is looking thinner. I know I'm getting old. Fortune smiling upside down. I'm a high roller with a frown. Fortune smiling upside down. I'm a high roller with a frown. Lobbying is about foresight. About anticipating your opponent's moves. She's your enemy now. And devising countermeasures. How the hell did she manage that? You're a piece of work, Elizabeth. I was hired to win. I use whatever resource I have. You want to lead the fight on gun control? There's over five million of us, and we're armed. Start an inquisition. They will throw you in jail for contempt of Congress! The winner plots one step ahead of the opposition. We have to make it personal. You know the word annihilate? It means reduce to nothing. This is more important than my career. It's mind-boggling. You crossed the line. A genius. Bugging and tapping. And completely unbelievable. About making sure you surprise them. And they don't surprise you. This has been On Air with Tony Sweet. Don't worry, there's more online. Search On Air with Tony Sweet on iTunes for past shows and exclusive behind-the-scenes content. On Air with Tony Sweet every Wednesday and Friday from 4 to 6 p.m. Pacific. Right here on UBNRadio.com.